Hey everyone. Well, whoa. I've used oh, such a big voice. I'm used to using a mic, so bear with me while I kind of adjust a second. Uh, but my name's Nick. Uh, weirdly, this still sounds nuts to say it. That imposter syndrome kicks in all the time. I'm a speaker on anxiety and mental health from a lived experience perspective. Again, important. Not a medical professional. Barely a professional or anything. Definitely not a medical professional. I share my learnings of my experiences. Um, I created something called Talk and Anxiety, started as my therapy. Uh, it's now become a movement. It's because It travels the world with me when I speak at companies and stuff. This is great just to not be in a conference center or a hotel. This is so cool, but I'm very chilled, so I've probably got to pick myself back up again in a second. Six years ago, I had a breakdown outside of a Premier Inn in North Somerset. Classy guy, eh? If I knew I was talking about this for a living, now I should have chosen one more exclusive. But it was a premiere in, and Lenny Henry was nowhere to be seen. Uh, he's everywhere on TV, but nowhere when I needed him. And the reason I got to that point was because of a couple of things. We don't schedule recovery. The stuff that we love to do and should do. The proactive recovery. If you've got a busy day, if you've got an important meeting, if you've got that awkward conversation, we don't schedule recovery and proactive recovery to get ourselves ready for that, but also to recover from that as well. The other thing is, uh, when it comes to that breakdown point, was when we suffer with low self-esteem, when we struggle with low self-confidence, when we struggle with anxiety and lots of different things, we put on a mask. We try and be what people want to see in us. We try and be what situations demand of us, but we sure don't show ourselves. Because when we do show ourselves, that's where our conditioning kicks in. That's where we line ourselves up to be dismissed or shot at or not liked or everything else that we go afraid or not worthy, we're not loved enough because we're showing ourselves. That's the fear, that's what we do. And that's where, why I got to that point. And actually, without getting too dark about this, it was either going to consume me or I had to let it out. Any Harry Potter fans in here? I'll take that, that's good. Uh, so it was like the bogger in the cupboard, the thing that I've kept in for so long. What would it look like, actually, if I let it out, if I showed the world me? Because actually, none of these masks were me. So the Harry Potter convinced me to do that. And I decided to speak at the same event after that I had the breakdown at before, two weeks later, about that. I don't recommend anybody go to a breakdown point, by the way, but it's truly liberating to think that you could say something and not really care about what happens afterwards. But all of those assumptions, 100%, I thought something was going to go one way. I thought people wouldn't like me. I thought people would dismiss me and lots of different things. When I finished the talk, which was truly terrible, and it was I was shaking and crying and had notes and everything else, and it was awful, but it was therapy for me because I felt a little bit better. But everybody in that room queued up to offer their support, to give me a hug. I love hugs. It's not a come on, but I do love hugs. Uh, to offer their insights, to share their experiences. For me, it changed everything because what they don't tell you again about mental health challenges, they are very selfish pastimes. I was very, very selfish because it becomes all consuming. It wasn't a choice to be selfish, but it was just all about me. So it was interesting when I started to share that and actually found out that people started sharing things about domestic abuse and sexual abuse and PTSD and their own challenges. Everyone's got the stuff going on that nobody sees because everyone's terrified of just speaking about stuff. Well, actually, I found that truth is liberating. So what that also taught me was I had to get very, very good at signposting very, very early as well. So if people are sharing things with you, again, you haven't got responsibility to treat or to advise or anything else, but just to listen. Because actually what I found in life is that actually essentially people just want to be heard and people want to be understood. And if you can fulfill that for anybody, they will find their own solution 90% of the time. No one's looking out to be treated. Everyone just wants to be heard. And, and we go by the wayside when we don't feel that we're being heard in life. And that's kind of how it started. That's how speaking started for me as a thing. It's, uh, I now help other people to speak as a, I find it very therapeutic to actually being able to tell the truth and, and not really worrying about what happens. Because actually when we do struggle with things like this, we get very sensitive, we become people pleasers. Who here has said yes to something they want to say no to? This week. <laughs> every day and that's what we do 
why why do we do that? Why do we give our own happiness away in the vain hope of appeasing others? It's crazy, but that's what we do. This uh, was XL London uh, in March. Five years ago, I actually had an anxiety attack whilst I was at that event, just by looking at the storeholders, being nervous and, and anxiety, anxious about the storeholders, looking at the slide stages and keynote speakers, thought I could never do that. Narrative, I could never do that. I was telling myself that, I was reinforcing that. And this year I got booked to my own right, but that is a breakdown. That's what can be achieved from using something, a catalyst. The business that I run is called Forging People, and that came from this. It's the fact that you can allow something, some adversity, some challenge to forge something truly beautiful that never existed in this world without that event happening. Because the other option by default is having a negative event define you for the rest of your days. And going back to every storm runs out of rain, sometimes you'll be approached by somebody who's really struggling. And again, I stress, you don't need to help anybody. But what you can do is actively listen. Because it could be the only time in their lives they decide to share with you. And they're sharing with you because they trust you. So there, therein lies a responsibility to be able just to be that listening ear. But we don't. We're scared of doing that because actually we feel that we need to treat people. And we don't. We just need to listen to understand. And as I said, essentially in life, people just want to be heard. They want to be understood. And if you can fulfill that for anybody, they'll find their own solution. It's when we don't feel heard that we feel lost and we lose hope. And as I said, that's when we lose everything. So thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I guess the message I want you to take from this is this. Everybody here has been through an adversity. I guarantee that. And you've lived because you're here, <laughs> you survived, and you thrived through that. The one thing I would encourage you to do is to consider sharing that. I think the truth is liberating. You don't have to be on stage sharing this. You can anonymously blog. You can create something with that as the, the catalyst, as the passion. Just give that some thought, because actually, if you can help just one other person, then that's what it's all about. That's why I'm here. That's why I go everywhere every day speaking about this stuff. That's the cause. That's the passion. Because I don't want to feel like there's anybody down that, I'm, that I could have reached without sharing that. But also when you give yourself, people open up right back at you. I was uh, uh, speaking at an event a few months ago in Bristol. And I was running two sessions. And the second session, a lady stayed on right to the end. And she come up, and obviously she was nervous. And she said, I noticed you've got a really scarred face. And I thought, well, I've had better chat up lines. <laughs> Thanks. I could tell it took a lot for her to come up and say that. And the closer she got, I noticed that she had scarrings too, and scarrings on her arm and stuff. She said, I'm sure you know this, but do you know that's linked to obsessive compulsive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder? She said, it's kind of like self-harm. It's called dermatillomania. It's compulsive skin picking. And I said, no. And of course, what we do when somebody confronts us about something we're sensitive about, I went full on defensive mode. No, not the case. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, I took her number. I spoke to my mum and I said, when did this start? When did I do the whole skin stuff? And, and she said, when you were seven, which is just when my OCD started. By sharing everything I had, she shared everything she had. I learned from that. And I've got a really valuable friend from that experience as well, because we've kept in touch since. So don't be afraid of sharing. That's all. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening.